Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. Our gathering together, as always, is unto you. Therefore, be present in power to teach, to instruct, to help, to lift up, O oh God, and to strengthen. Thank you that the words that we will learn today, the truths that we will learn today, the lessons from you, this prophet Isaiah, Father, they will be clear, they will be simple to apply and to imbibe in our lives. Thank you, Lord God, for this fellowship, for what you're doing in us, with us, and through us. We ask that you continue to be Lord over us individually and collectively. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Uh, we continue our study of the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. We stopped yesterday at chapter 28, and we will pick it up today at chapter 29. Uh, chapter 28 was the beginning of the fourth uh, part of our outline. Praise God. And it's about the prophecies and uh, of judgment and mercy concerning the children of Israel. So chapter 29. Woe to Ariel, to Ariel, the city where David dwelt. Add ye year to year, let them kill sacrifices. Yet I will distress Ariel, and there shall be heaviness and sorrow, and it shall be unto me as Ariel. And I will camp against thee round about, and will lay siege against thee with a mount. And I will raise forts against thee, and thou shalt be brought down, and shall speak out of the ground. And thy speech shall be low out of the dust, and thy voice shall be as of one that hath a familiar spirit out of the ground and thy speech shall whisper out of the dust. Moreover, the multitude of thy strangers shall be like small dust, and the multitude of the terrible ones shall be as chaff that passeth away. Yea, it shall be at an instant suddenly, thou shalt be visited of the Lord of hosts with thunder and with earthquake and great noise, with storm and tempest and, and the flame of devouring fire. And the multitude of all nations that fight against Ariel, even all that fight against her and her munition and that distress her shall be as a dream of a night vision. It shall even be as when an hungry man dreameth and behold, he eateth, but he awaketh and his soul is empty. Or as when a thirsty man dreameth and behold, he drinketh, but he awaketh and behold, he is faint and his soul hath appetite. So shall the multitude of all the nations be that fight against Mount Zion. Stay yourselves and wonder, cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep and hath closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers, the tears hath he covered. And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed. When men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. There, wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among the, this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of the prudent men shall be hid. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord, and their works are in the dark. And they say, Who seeth us, and who knoweth us? Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. For shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not? Or shall the thing framed say unto him that framed it, he had no understanding? Is, is it not yet a very little while, and Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be esteemed as a forest? And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. The meek also shall increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. For the terrible one is brought to naught, and the scorner is consumed, 
and all that watch for iniquity are cut off, that make a man an offender for a word, and lay a snare for him that reproveth in the gate, and turn aside the just for a thing of naught. Therefore thus saith the Lord who redeemed Abraham, concerning the house of Jacob, Jacob shall not now be ashamed, neither shall her face now wax pale. For when he seeth his children, the work of mine hands in the midst of him, they shall sanctify my name and sanctify the Holy One of Jacob and shall fear the God of Israel. They also that erred in spirit shall come to understanding and they that murmured shall learn doctrine. Praise God. Again, as we have seen and as we now know, uh, Isaiah's prophecies are <clears throat> either for the distant future or for the immediate future of the children of Israel, distant future to them, but the past to us now, this present time, and sometimes it's distant future, both for them and for us. And we see little pieces of this chapter of the book um, expressing that truth. It opens with warnings for Judah and Jerusalem of the impending discipline that God has in mind because of their apostasy. He says, woe to Ariel. Ariel is another name for Jerusalem. Uh, the Hebrew meaning renders it the, the Lion of God. Uh, but it's clear uh, when the Bible says the city where David dwelt. We know from our study of First and Second Kings and the Chronicles uh, that David dwelt in Jerusalem. He made Jerusalem his capital, praise God, uh, so God is pronouncing war to Jerusalem because Jerusalem was going to be invaded and Jerusalem was going to fall. As a matter of fact, all of Judah was going to fall. All right. And God says, you can sacrifice all you want because the state of their heart was unclean. We read later on in the chapter that they do profess him with their mouths. Uh, I think it's verse... Verse 13 says, For as much as these people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips they honor me, but have removed their heart from far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precepts of men or the ideas of men. Because of that, God says you can kill all the sacrifices you want to. You can do all the oblations you want to. I'm not going to listen. Jerusalem will be judged. He says, in spite of all of those things, verse 2, I will distress Jerusalem. And there shall be heaviness and sorrow. And it shall be unto me as Ariel. So God is saying, I really don't want to do this. But your, your, your way of life, your manner of conversation, your heart is not with me. Even though you profess me, uh, you know, with your mouth and with all the, the visible trappings, uh, the naughtiness of religiosity, you, you make it look like you're really following me, but you're not. And it grieves my heart to have to um, allow justice to prevail, which is what God is saying in verse 2. I will distress Israel in spite of all the sacrifices that they kill and all the oblations that they make. I will distress Israel. There will be heaviness and sorrow, and it will be exactly like that to me as well. So God is saying that even though I have to discipline you and I have to let the, the righteous side of me and the justice side of me uh, uh, have its way, have its course, it's going to be painful to me. It's not something I really want to do. But you guys, the way that you're living, uh, this is the end result of, of uh, the way that you're living. He says, I will come against you round about. I will lay siege. He begins to describe how he will use the surrounding nations to uh, chastise them. He talks about the fact that they will be brought down so low that if they are speaking, it, it will be mutterings. You know, it says uh, right here that their speech will be like a whisper out of the dust. It will be as someone that is, uh, someone that has a familiar spirit, you know. Um, it talks about the fact that the strangers shall be as small dust, multitude of the terrible ones shall be as chaff that passeth away. Uh, it's going to be very bitter. This particular prophecy serves both, um, both the immediate future of Israel 
and the future that's also our future because we did see Jerusalem invaded first by Babylon, then by Assyria. Uh, and then they were scattered abroad until they were brought back together uh, in this our own generation. But it's also going to be applicable when the Antichrist comes against Jerusalem and Jesus uh, at the battle of Armageddon will take him on and de 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 defeat him. Um, we'll see when we get to the book of Revelation where God tells his people to flee to a particular place that he has reserved where he plans to preserve them so that Israel will be, will be kept during that terrible time that the Antichrist is forming the fool. All right, uh, God says in verse six, seven signs of God's visitation is clear there. They will be visited with thunder and with earthquake, great noise, storm, tempest, and uh, flame of devouring fire. And even in recent times here in the United States, we have seen evidence of this. We've had all kinds of storms. We had Katrina, we had Harvey. We've had all kinds of fires last year. There was forest fire raging in California and they found it extremely difficult to control or to stop. So things like this happen when God is displeased. But unfortunately, the church is not talking very much about judgment. We're very concerned about prosperity. We're concerned about, about stuff where we should have a balance of scriptures where people should know that the God who is the God who blesses and blesses you beyond your wild, wildest imaginations is the same God who will judge sin and who will not tolerate nonsense. And we see God in, in small measures at different times bringing judgment even upon uh, the, this land that we all live in, but we don't pay attention to it. We just carry on with our lives, especially if it doesn't concern us, you know? But that's the way God does things uh, until he's finally ready to wrap it all up together. Verse seven says, the multitude of all the nations that fight against Ariel, even all that fight against her and ammunition and that distress her shall be as a dream of a night vision. If you don't understand what Isaiah is saying here, you, you might think he's saying everything he has said earlier uh, figuratively, that's not what he's saying. He's saying in verse seven, that all those self same nations that fight against Israel, even though it's the hand of the Lord that's doing it, that's using them as a scourge uh, for their iniquity and for their apostasy. He's saying their, their uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Their thoughts or their thinking that they are going to be able to overcome the children of Israel is like a dream. God is in essence saying, don't, don't rejoice and don't think you've got these people where you want them. I still have control over all of the situations, even though I am the one that is causing them to be chastised by using you, I still have control. And you can only go so far with my child. And it's the same thing in our lives. Sometimes we go through challenges, we go through difficult times. I remember times that I've groaned before the Lord and I've said, ah, Lord, it's enough. How much more can I take? It's like, I'm, it's like, might as well just kill me and bring me back home. I can't take this anymore. You know, we, we've been there. Uh, at least I, I, I want to believe that you've been, you've been tried and tested like that. I know certainly that I have multiple times. And it's like, God, I, I'm done. Just take me home. I, I can't deal with this anymore. But in all of that, he strengthens me. What God is saying here is, you guys, you're dreaming. If you think you're going to totally annihilate Israel, <laughs> you've got another thing coming. I'm the one that's using you to chastise them. So don't get cocky and confident and think you can annihilate them. It's not possible. This is what God is saying. It will be, you know, your, your temporary victory over Israel it will be as somebody who is hungry and who goes to sleep and in his sleep he eats food and he thinks he's satisfied only to wake up and see that, oh, it was just a dream, I'm still hungry. Or he goes to bed thirsty, and in his, dream, in his sleep he, he dreams and he drinks water, and he wakes up and, he's, and he finds out that, oh, it was just a dream, I'm still, I'm still thirsty. So God is saying, don't be too, too, too confident. Don't think that you're going to totally annihilate my people. If you have an upper hand right now, it's because I have allowed it. 
so that I can chasten them and bring them to a place of repentance. That's what verses 7 and 8 is saying. Stay yourselves and wonder, cry ye out, cry ye out. They're drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord had poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep and had closed your eyes. And the prophets and your rulers, the seers, he have covered. Um, sometimes the way the Bible renders uh, these truths make it look like God is this, this fiendish, uh, horrible person that, that just takes delight in punishing people and making their lives difficult. No, it is the choices that man makes that puts them in the position that they find themselves in. The God of mercy, the God of love, 100% mercy, 100% love is also the God of justice, 100%. So he sends mercy and he sends love and he sends encouragement and he draws you and he pulls you and he woos you and he loves you and he picks you up and he comforts you and he sets you up again and he's long suffering and he's patient. But one day, justice will get up and say, ah, it's enough. It's my turn. This is what is happening to the children of Israel here. All right. So when the Bible says the Lord has poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, it's not like God is sitting down playing with men's lives. No, that's not what's going on. But because they have drawn themselves away from him, because they don't trust him anymore, because they don't follow his precepts, his commandments, his statutes, his word, they're doing what they want to do, how they want to do it. I mean, if you go back to the book of, uh, 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 which book is that? Judges, especially, where God will send judge after judge after judge after judge. They will be captured. They will be going through horrible times. They would cry to the Lord, and then the Lord will send a judge to, to save them out, out of the hands of the Philistines or the Midianites or whatever. Once they are comfortable, they start their nonsense again. This is what is going on here. So it's the choices that they have made that have brought the nation to where it's at, where their seers don't see anymore. Their prophets prophesy lies. Their kings are unrighteous and they don't defend the cause of the needy, the cause of the widow, the cause of the fatherless. Everybody's just doing anyhow that he likes. It is those choices that brings about the judgment of God. All right. He said it's going to be like someone that they give a book to and even though he's learning, he cannot read it. He cannot understand it because he thinks the book is sealed. Uh, and for the guy who uh, is not learning, they give him the book, he cannot comprehend it. So it's useless talking to him, it's useless prophesying to him, it's useless trying to teach him because they have decided to break the covenant. They have decided to walk away from the Lord. Okay? Uh, verse 13, it says, for as much as these people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips, they honor me, but they have removed their heart from me and their fear toward me is taught by the, the doctrines of men. God sees the heart. God is not interested in the outward man. The outward man is perishing. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't interest God in the sense that that's what matters. It's the inner man that matters. It's your spirit that matters. It's your, your soul, your mind, the things you're thinking about, the things you're dwelling on. Those are the things that matter. Because if you align the spirit with the soul, you will put the body in subjection. The Bible tells us that in Galatians 5. What the spirit wants to do, the flesh doesn't want to do. And what the flesh wants to do, the spirit doesn't want to do. And the battle is in the area of your mind. It's in your soul. If you align your soul with your spirit, you'll keep the body in subjection. If you align your soul with your body, you will do what the body wants to do and you will grieve the spirit. And by extension, the spirit of God. That's why the Bible enjoins that you take captive every thought and bring it to the obedience of Christ. Who is Christ? The word. Who is the word? Christ. So you take captive those thoughts and you bring them into obedience to the word of God. Who is Christ Jesus himself? That's how to do it. It's your mind through your will, controlling your emotions and dictating your outcomes. That's how the believer, the born again child of God is supposed to conduct their lives. 
many of us still do my mind, my emotions, then everything is messed up. No, my mind and my will tell my emotions what to do. Tell my body be quiet. Tell my body sit down. Control my appetite, both for food and for sex and for whatever, so that I can live a life that's worthy of the death that he died on the cross for me. All right? God says, because you guys have done that, verse 14, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among you guys. I will do a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of the wise men shall perish and the understanding of the prudent man shall be hid. See, there will be no remedy because God has been long suffering and God has been patient. You can see how this applies to the immediate future of the children of Israel, as Isaiah wrote. And you can also see how it applies to our future that is to come. Because the day is coming when the king of glory will come and will have to separate the goat nations from the sheep nations. And will have to separate the righteous and the unrighteous. He will judge. Make no mistakes about that. It's just that the cup of iniquity of the entire universe is not full yet. Okay. Uh, he say woe on, he says, woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord and their works are in the dark, and they think no one sees them, and they think no one knows, which is the, the it is the height of stupidity, because our God is all-knowing, He's all-powerful, He's omniscient, He's omnipotent. All right, nothing is hid from His eyes. That's why He says, uh, uh, verse 16, surely the turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. All right, can the, can the, can the vessel of clay say to the potter, why have you made me thus? It's in the discretion of the potter to make one lump of clay into a vessel of honor and make another lump of clay into a vessel of dishonor. He, he controls the clay. Whatever he wants to do with it is what he will do with it. And you can't say to, the clay cannot say to the, to the potter, why have you made me thus? He also says, uh, uh, the work that is made, can he say that the person who made him did not make him? Or the thing that is framed, can that thing that is framed say that the person who framed, framed it has uh, no knowledge or lacks understanding? All right. And then God begins to talk about the blessings after the deliverance comes. It, it's uh, somewhat applicable to the future of Israel, and it's definitely applicable to the millennial age that is to come. Is it not yet a very little while, and Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field, and the fruitful field shall be esteemed a forest? All right, to tell you that Lebanon is part of the uh, land area that God gave to the children of Israel in the first place. But because of the dispersion, all of these other nations have emerged. The old Israel, if you go back to the book of Genesis, when God was speaking to Moses, goes as far down as Ethiopia into Africa. And Ethiopia, uh, many, many centuries ago, stretched all the way into West Africa. So technically, the land that God gave uh, Israel originally, all of Arabia, all of Lebanon, all of Jordan, all of... Uh, 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 Africa, right down to Ethiopia, stretching into West Africa. That was the original plan of God. It's like his original plan in the, uh, in the Garden of Eden before the serpent came in and messed everything. We never would have known sin. We never would have known sicknesses. We never would have known any disease because none of that is in God. It was the fall of man and the rulership of the devil because he's the one in charge now. Remember when he tempted the Lord Jesus Christ, I think it's Luke chapter four, when he took him to the highest pinnacle of the temple and he told him, if, you, if you'll only just worship me, I'll give you all of this, the kingdoms of this world. The Bible says he showed him in a moment of time. And he says, if you just bow down and worship me, I will, I will give it to you. And then he makes a very profound, audacious statement. He says, for it has been given unto me. What would give the devil the audacity to say that to the Lord Jesus Christ? It is because in Genesis, 
Adam turned over the reins and the rule of this earth that God had given to him to have dominion over, he turned it over to the devil. That's why the devil could say to Jesus, it belongs to me. And to whomsoever I will, I give it. All right? It starts. Lebanon. He has a covenant with Israel. So when Jesus comes, all of those things will be restored to Israel. You're frozen, Pastor. Huh? I think it kicked her off. You, she, no, she's back on, but she's muted. Pastor, Ma, you have to unmute yourself. Unmute. Yeah. yeah, we were talking about the blessings that's going to follow. And I was saying to you that it could be, um, it could be applicable to the immediate future of Israel and it could be applicable to the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. It says the meek will increase their joy. Verse 19, the poor will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. Because the terrible one is brought to naught. The people that will invade uh, Israel, they will be brought to naught because God will rise up and defend his son. It could also be applicable to the end times where God will fight the Antichrist. The Lord Jesus Christ will fight the Antichrist in the battle of Armageddon and he will de defeat him and he will establish his 1,000 year reign of peace. We'll see all of that in the book of Revelation when we get there. All right. So it's applicable to both uh, eras, if you like. Uh, for the terrible one is brought to naught and the scorner is consumed and all that watch for iniquity are cut off that, that make a man an offender for a word and lay a snare for him that reproveth in the gate and turn aside the just for a thing of naught. So all of those workers of iniquity, all of those wicked people, God will deal with. Therefore, verse 22, thus said the Lord who redeemed Abraham, Concerning the house of Jacob, Jacob shall not now be ashamed, neither shall his face now wax pale, because God will fight and he will restore him. But when he seeth his children, the work of my hands in the midst of him, they shall sanctify my name and sanctify the Holy One of Jacob and shall fear the God of Israel. So God will fight for Israel and he will restore Israel. So Palestine or Palestine or whatever they're called, they can do whatever they like. The Arabic nations can do whatever they want to do. Iraq, Iran, they can come against her all they want. They will never, never be able to do anything with that little band of people whom God has chosen as his own and whom he has loved as an everlasting love. And when we, see, with an everlasting love, and when we see how God is jealous over Israel, shouldn't we, the more, be glad? We Gentiles that were grafted in, we, we who were not a people, but now are a people. Bible says we are a chosen generation. He chose us. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people unto God. He called us out of darkness into light, not because of anything you and I have done, but because he loves us. Amen. They also that erred in spirit shall come to understanding and they that murmured shall learn doctrine. So all of those who were even in error, who were saying all kinds of things about Jesus, who rejected him as the Messiah, who would not recognize him in his first advent, they will now learn. 
And there's a lesson here for us too. It says, they that moment shall learn doctrine. That's cure for murmuring. If you ever are tempted to murmur or to complain, go and find out what God has to say about your situation. It will give peace to your heart. It will bring patience to your mind and you'll be able to wait on God rather than murmur and complain about whatever it is that you're murmuring and complaining about. Any questions? Pastor Mo, in first, I have two questions. My first question is, what's the difference between brokenness before God and repentance? Brokenness is what brings repentance. Okay. The Bible says, godly sorrow walketh repentance. Okay. That's, that's one form of brokenness. There's another form of brokenness where you're born again. It's, it has nothing to do with iniquity or sin, but you're just so broken before the awesome presence of God. Sometimes you get in his presence and all you can do is weep. That's brokenness. You, 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 you're just full. You don't know what to say. That's one form of brokenness. Does that answer your question? Okay, so brokenness basically is accepting that without God, you are absolutely nothing, one. It can be that, or it can also be like in the light of revelation that what you see about God and see yourself, it leads to brokenness. It just flows you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, then in, I think it was verse 13, where it talks about the meek and the poor, is it, you know how it says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Is that that kind of poor or is the it's poor, a, poor, it's poor? A, it's that kind of poor. It's not talking about poverty. Okay. It is, it is when you realize that you're poor in spirit, that you go to find out from God, from the word, how to not be poor in spirit. And that takes meekness. That takes a, 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 an accurate and, and honest appraisal of yourself, which then drives you to him, who is able to fill whatever the ache or the void is in your spirit, in your heart. Okay, meekness is the same as humility. No. It's not, okay, because what's the difference? Um, humility, I think I would like to ascribe to the area of the soul. Because humility is the opposite of pride. Okay, so humility... Say again. So, so humility is God without you. I have nothing. I know nothing. I can do nothing. Yeah, that's, that's expressing humility towards God. Okay. I, I, I would, if I was to classify, because humility is not a spiritual gift. Uh -uh. Humility is something you make yourself do. It's a choice. You humble, you humble yourself. Okay? It's different from meekness. Meekness is a spiritual thing. Uh, come to Galatians 5.22. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Are you there? Galatians 5. Galatians 20, 5, what? 22. 22. Okay. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness. So meekness comes from your spirit. Humility is from your soul. Because it's something you make yourself do. You humble yourself. It's not a spiritual gift. Okay. Or so a like, fruit of spirit. Okay, so like, you know how, in, I think it, it's Peter's letter there. It says, humble yourself. Um, under, under the mighty hand of God. Okay, so like, it's a choice that you make. Yes. I can decide okay. to walk in pride. I can decide to walk in pride because, because I have a wealthy son. I treat people anyhow, I spend money anyhow, 
and I just do whatever I like. And somebody says something, I deal with them because I have money. I get one or two people to rough them up because I, that's stupidity. Okay, Pastor, I've, I've been studying pride. Yes. But pride also comes in another one that is kind of like very sneaky. And sometimes I think I, I wasn't conscious of it is where from the priest men, from the, you know how it's like, um, oh, you do this thing very, very well. And like you continue hearing it and hearing it. And that's why sometimes you start believing your own press because there's, there, there, there's our own, you know, like for us, I think that like, I think as if people were very prideful people because we are the ones that go around saying, "Do you know who I am?" So there's oh, there's yeah. that there's one there's that one that is the cell phone, but there's also the one that comes from people praising you or acknowledging a gift that is in you and you not giving the glory back to God because that one hits me like a slap in my face. Exactly. See, we're made in his image and likeness. We are exactly like him, our spirits, exactly like him. Just as he loves praise, we love praise too. But we don't keep it. If you praise me, I don't hold on to it. I give it to him. Because I recognize that whatever you're praising me about or whatever you're praising me for came from him. So there's nothing wrong with people praising you. Nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with people acknowledging that you're brilliant at what you do. There's nothing wrong with you even knowing that you do what you do well, but you don't get puffed up because you know that you couldn't do what you do well if it wasn't for his grace. So I receive the praise, the praise. I'm thankful for the praise, but I don't keep it. I, get, I take it to him and I say, Father, to you be all the glory. I couldn't have done that as well as I did it for all of these people to be thanking me and praising me. It's when you keep it that you are sharing in his glory and he doesn't share his glory with anybody. Then Pastor Mo, there was another one that my own, I was convicted on is when I now do something and nobody says anything and I'm irritated or resentful that they did not acknowledge what I did. It's called Ouch. flesh. It's called flesh. <laughs> we all have it. We all have it. I mean, you're like, ah, ah. after all I did, it's flesh. You have to beat it into subjection. The, the moment you mention I, you need to pause. Not that it doesn't hurt, you know, when you, when you have been so good to someone or you've, you've gone over and beyond or, or you've even done it at a denial to yourself uh, of, let, let's, say, let's say all I have left is $100 and, and someone comes and they say thus and such and, and I move to give them the $100. And they just take it and go off on their merry way. They don't, even, they don't even come back and say thank you like the nine lepers. Your flesh will remind you. But what are you going to do? Are you going to let your emotions rob you of the reward that should come from your father as against the reward of a human saying thank you? I'd rather God says thank you to me. Because then I know that it will be a blessing that will be a blessing. So it's not uncommon and you're not alone. And don't let the enemy bash you over there with that. No. And Pastor Mo, it's not just I. It's I, me, myself. <laughs> That's why I said when you say, when, when you say anything and the word I comes up, you, you need to be I, careful. Me and Pastor Mo, I, me and myself. <laughs> Yes, me, myself, and I. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. whenever, whenever, we, whenever we use those words, we need to be careful. We really, really need to be careful because that name I am is God. And anything you say after it begins to create. It is the creative name of God. Even in, in, in us as humans, when you say, I am tired, you feel more tired. If you're tired and you jump up and you say, I'm strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, you'll find out that the spirit of tiredness will lift. So 
we will continue to deal with this flesh until our redemption. And it draweth nigh. That's the joy. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Chapter 30. Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, and that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, that walk to go down into Egypt, and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh, and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame, and the trust in the shadow of Egypt your confusion. For his princes were, were at Zoan, and his ambassadors came to Haines. They, they were all ashamed of a people that could not profit them, nor be an help, nor profit, but a shame and also a reproach. The burden of the beasts of the south into the land of trouble and anguish, from whence come the young and old lion, the viper and fiery flying serpent. They will carry their riches upon the shoulders of young asses, and their treasures upon the bunches of camels to a people that shall not profit them. For the Jishan shall help in vain and to no purpose. Therefore have I cried concerning this, their strength is to sit still. Now go, write it before them in a table and note it in a book, that it may be for the time to come forever and ever, that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord which say to seers, see not, and to prophets, prophesy not unto us right things. Speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits. Get you out of the way, turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Wherefore thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because ye despise this word and trust in oppression and perverseness and stay thereon, therefore this iniquity shall be to you as a breach ready to fall swelling out in a high wall, whose breaking cometh suddenly at an instant. And he shall break it as the breaking of the potter's vessel that is broken in pieces. He shall not spare, so that there shall not be found in the bursting of it a shirt to take fire from the hearth, or to take water withal out of the pit. Hallelujah. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall ye be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. And ye would not. For ye said no. For we will flee upon horses. Therefore shall ye flee. And we will ride upon the swift. Therefore shall they that pursue you be swift. One thousand shall flee at the rebuke of one. At the rebuke of five shall ye, shall ye flee. Till ye be left as a beacon upon the top of a mountain and as an ensign on a hill. And therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you. And therefore will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are they all that wait for him. For the Lord shall dwell in Zion, in Zion at Jerusalem. Thou shalt weep no more. He will, he will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry, when he shall hear it, he will answer thee. And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, ye shall, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore. But thine eyes shall see thy teachers, and thine ears shall hear a word behind thee saying, This is the way, walk in it. When ye turn to the right hand, and when ye turn to the left hand. Ye shall defile also the covering of thy graven images of silver and the ornament of thy molten images of gold. Thou shalt cast them away as a menstruous cloth. Thou shalt say unto it, Get thee hence. Then shall he give the rain of thy seed, that thou shalt sow the ground withal, and bread of the increase of the earth, and it shall be fat and plenteous. And in that day shall thy cattle feed in large pastures, the oxen likewise, and the young asses that ear the, the ground, and the young asses that ear the ground shall eat clean provender, which hath been winnowed with a shovel and with the fan. And there shall be upon every high mountain and upon every high hill, rivers and streams of waters in the day of the great slaughter when the towers fall. 
Moreover, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun shall be sevenfold as the light of seven days in the day that the Lord bindeth up the breach of his people and healeth the stroke of their wound. Behold, the name of the Lord cometh from afar, burning with his anger, and the burden thereof is heavy. His lips are full of indignation, and his tongue as a devouring fire, and his breath as an overflowing stream shall reach to the midst of the neck to sift the nations with a sieve of vanity, and there shall be a bridle in the jaws of the people, causing them to err. Ye shall have a song as in the night when a holy, when a holy solemnity is kept, and gladness of heart as when one goeth with a pipe to come into the mountain of the Lord to the mighty one of Israel. And the Lord shall cause his glorious voice to be heard and shall show the lightning and shall show the lightning down of his arm with the indignation of his anger and with the flame of a devouring fire with scattering and tempest and hailstones. For through the voice of the Lord shall the Assyrian be beaten down with smote with a rod. And in every place where the ground staff shall pass, which the Lord shall lay upon it, he shall be with tabrets and harps and in battles of shaking will he fight with it. For Tophet is ordained of old, yea, for the king it is prepared. He hath made it deep and large. The pile thereof is fire and much wood. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, doth kindle it. Praise God. That's a very long chapter. But the second woe is pronounced in this section that we're looking at. Remember, we said it's prophecies of judgment and mercy. Okay. God says woe to the rebellious children of Israel because they take counsel, but not of him. And they seek covering that is not of his spirit. And by so doing, they add sin upon sin. We can preach an entire message on that alone in our lives and in our society today because people have walked away from God. The nation has walked away from God. Although there's still a whole bunch of us that are believers, um, it's always God's style for, for people to think I'm the only one left but you're never the only one left. God always has a remnant. He has a huge number of believers. But because we're disconnected, we don't know. And all we see, all we hear, all the news carries, all the TV does, our entertainment uh, uh, industry has been hijacked way, 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 way. Back in the 60s, has been hijacked by the devil. And we didn't know it. And Christians were ignorant and stupid. We called the TV the devil's box. And for the longest time, we wouldn't take advantage of all of the things that he could do for us. All right? Same thing with music. I remember back in Nigeria when we started to introduce the guitar and the drums and choruses in, in church. Our parents' churches, the old Orthodox, Methodist, Anglican, Baptist, they were persuaded that their children were possessed by devils. How can you beat drums in church? It had to be the organ. You had to sing hymns to organ music. You couldn't play any other instrument. It was an abomination back in the day. And look at it today. The Bible says in Psalms 150, to prison with all manner of music instruments. But we shut the church out and, and kids who wanted to dance and jump and do whatnot could not relate to standing up and sitting down, standing up and sitting down and singing a song, singing the verses of the song, the same tune over and over and over and over and over again. And so a lot of people start going to church. Here in America, I observed it. I saw it. It started with movies like uh, TV programs like I Dream of Jeannie, Bewitched. They repackaged witchcraft and they turned it into comedy. And we would sit down and watch that nonsense. All right? Uh, Adam's Family, Harry Potter. And parents don't see anything that's wrong with it. 
Your kids are reading about witchcraft. Okay, Satan is not crazy. He's not going to come to you and tell you this is witchcraft. Practice it. But there are ways that he will do stuff. There's a book called The Shack. I had to sit down and read it. I'm not recommending that you read it unless you know scriptures. I do not recommend that you read it unless you understand the word of God. It is written with the highest form of deception ever. The book is called The Shack. In it, the Godhead uh, is female. That alone is blasphemy. And the guy who is experiencing whatever he's experiencing in the shack that he's living where these spirit beings come to him and they're supposedly God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It's just a whole bunch of nonsense. And the guy who wrote it made millions of dollars from it because people have itchy ears. Even Christians think it's a godly book. It's not. They repackaged stuff on TV. And they began to influence our thinking. And they began to lower our threshold, our tolerance for iniquity till we are where we are today. Kids have seen murders. Young kids, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 15 year olds from the movies that they watch. Because those things are as graphic as it really, really happening. That's how they have perfected that industry. God have mercy on us. All right, they seek counsel. That's not of God. They consult mediums, they consult healers. They're all over Instagram. All right, they consult the stars. Why am I speaking to the stars when I know the person who created stars? They consult tarot card readers, palm readers, fortune tellers. The Bible says they walk to go down into Egypt. We're going to talk about it as it applies in this prophetic way, but I'm, I'm also trying to apply it to present day life in this country. Every time you see and they went down to. It's an indication of spiritual descent. And Abraham went down into. And Judah went down to. It's always significant of spiritual declension. Okay? Egypt is, uh, Israel is threatened by Sennacherib, the king of Assyria. And in their stupidity, they go back to the country where they were in bondage for 430 years. Their former arch enemies. How, how do you expect them to help you? What are you thinking that you would go to someone who you know doesn't care two pennies about you to ask them to help you? They go down to Egypt. They have not asked God for strength. They have not asked God what they should do. They have not called for repentance and fasting. They have not chastised their spirits and their souls to say, Lord, we have erred, we have sinned. Have mercy on us. What should we do? These people are far, 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 uh, mightier than us. Compare this to Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 20, when the children of Ammon, Mount Seir, and Moab came against him. The Bible says he declared a fast and he called for the prophets and he called for prayer. God spoke through the prophet and told them, don't be afraid. This is my battle. I will fight it. But you see, Israel's neck had gotten so thick at this time. They had gone so far out on a limb. They don't even remember the God who delivered them out of Egypt with a strong arm. So they go to Egypt. They have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves, but rather they trust in the strength of Pharaoh. They trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore, God says the strength of Pharaoh will fail you because you'll be ashamed. Your trust in the shadow of Egypt will bring confusion to you. Your princes that you have sent to carry all manner of treasuries to appease the Pharaoh 
of Egypt is a waste of your time. Verse 5, you will all be ashamed because you are going to a people that cannot profit you. They cannot help you, but they will be a shame and a reproach to you. All your burden of beasts that you have laden with, with riches and, and goods and stuff to go and <clears throat> bribe him to defend you or to, or to form an alliance with you. It's all not going to profit you. Verse 7, the help of the Egyptians is in vain and to no purpose. Therefore, Isaiah is crying, speaking on the behalf of God. Your strength is in being still. Child of God is not in running around. It's not in calling Celeste, calling uh, Joel, calling Miss Caroline, calling Sumbo. Ah, what do you think? What's your opinion? Uh, how can you help me? Uh, what should I? No, your strength is in being still. He says, be still and know that I am God. There's a difference between waiting for God and waiting on God. If you are waiting for God, you will run ahead of him because his timing is not your timing. If you are waiting on God, then you will wait in quiet confidence, knowing that he's never a second late, he's never a second early. He's a right on time God. He will fix that situation because he's got everything under his control. The Egyptians, shall help in vain and to no purpose. Therefore have I cried concerning this, their strength is to sit still. Don't forget that, child of God. He says, write it in a book, write it on tablets, so that the generations that are coming will know. If it's just spoken, they may forget, they may forget but write it down. So it will be passed from generation to generation to generation. The Bible says it is his strength and quietness that shall be your stability. Okay? This is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the Lord, law of the Lord. They, they, <clears throat> they chase the prophets away. They chase the seers away. They want the ones that will, you know, they have itchy ears. They have the ones that will speak sweet words to them and will not tell them the truth. Many get offended and they leave. I thank God that I'm not a church and I don't have overhead. Because if I had overheads, where would I be with five of you in fellowship? Twelve of you in fellowship? What could I do? All right? Same thing with Jesus. <laughs> Some left. They said his sayings are too hard. And Jesus turned to the twelve. He said, are you guys going to leave too? And they said, what are we going to do? Go. You have the word of life. We're not going. But people are so fickle. Once they don't hear what they want to hear or they think you're saying what you ought not to say, they will leave. But thank God, like I said, I have no overheads. I have no need of money, of tithes. Of... If you do it, you do it for yourself. Praise God. All right? So he's write it down. <clears throat> because they've chased out all the prophets, all the ones who tell them the truth. They don't want to hear it. Tell them to get away, turn aside out of the path. And, and we don't want to hear about the Holy One of Israel anymore. So God answers in verse 12, because you have despised the Holy One of Israel and his word, and you would rather trust in oppression and perverseness, and you continue in it, you stay thereon. As a result of that, this iniquity will be for you as a breach ready to fall. So anything that you think you're fortifying yourself with, Watch it crumble, is what God is saying. All right? He shall break it as the breaking of the potter's vessel that is broken in pieces. It will be completely shattered. Shattered to smithereens in such a way that uh, you will not even find a piece that you can use to scoop hot coals from the fire. You will not find a piece that you can use to take water out of the pit. It will be shattered to smithereens, is what God is saying in verse 14. All right? 
For thus said the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, it is in returning to me and in rest that you will be saved, in quietness and in confidence that I am who I am and I will do what I have said I will do concerning you. It is in that that you will find strength. That's what God is saying. But you would not. Rather, you said, verse 16, we will flee upon horses. If they come against us, we will, we will escape. We will ride upon the swift. God says, I will make the person chasing you swifter than you. You will not escape my judgment. 1,000 will flee at the rebuke of one. At the rebuke of five, you will flee till you are left as a beacon upon the top of a mountain and an ensign in a hill, till everybody sees what has become of you. He's talking to Israel. Therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for him. For the Lord shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem, that thou shalt weep no more. Now from verse 19, up onto uh, 21, he switches, Isaiah switches, and he begins to talk about the millennial age. Because we see that what he's saying here has not happened yet. So we know it's future, future. All right? Verse 19, he says, For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem, thou shalt weep no more. But that's not the case. Israel is still weeping. They're still fighting, and they're still losing citizens. So we know he's not talking about the immediate future uh, uh, that he's, uh, Isaiah is not talking about the immediate future, our past of Israel. He's talking about the future future of everybody, both us and them. All right, so he switches and he's talking about the millennial period. And though the Lord, uh, verse 19, for the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem, thou shalt weep no more. He will be very gracious unto thee and the voice of thy cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer thee. And though the Lord give you the bread of uh, adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore. The teachers that they were driving away, the prophets that they were driving away, they didn't want to know about God. They didn't want to hear about God. They will now come back and be prominent because they will begin to instruct the people of God in righteousness. All right? <clears throat> yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore, but thine eyes shall see thy teachers. Verse 21. Because of the teachers, because of the righteous uh, seers and prophets that will be teaching them the way of righteousness, they will now be able to hear a word behind them saying, this is the way, walk in it. And when you turn to the right hand and to turn to the left hand, it's the millennial uh, times that he's now talking about because God will dwell in the midst of us and we will be practicing righteousness. We will hear him leading, guiding, telling us what to do. All right, we, you shall defile also the covering of thy graven images of silver and the ornament of thy molten images of gold. Thou shalt cast them away as a menstruous cloth. Thou shalt say to it, get thee hence. Everybody will then turn away from idolatry. This is the millenn millennial era. Then shall he give the rain of thy seed and thou shalt sow the ground with all and the bread of the increase of the earth and it shall be fat and plenteous. In that day shall thy cattle feed and all the blessings that will come as a result of him dwelling in the midst of us. All right? Begins to talk about it from verse 23, 24, 25, 26. We're going to be so blessed. Verse 27, behold, the name of the Lord cometh from far, burning with his anger, and the burden thereof is heavy. He has switched now. He's speaking prophetically to Israel again in verse 27. All right? Behold, the name of the Lord cometh from afar, burning with anger, and the burden thereof is heavy. His lips are full of indignation, and his tongue as a devouring fire. So if you go to verse 31, you, it confirms that from 27 to 30, he's talking about Israel's immediate future, where the Assyrian army was going to invade, invade them. Verse 31 says, For through the voice of the Lord, shall the Assyrian be beaten down, which smote with a rod. And in every place where the ground staff shall pass, which the Lord shall lay upon him, it shall be with tablets and harps, and in battles of shaking will he fight with it. So God is going to restore, and everywhere that God passes to restore, it shall be with tablets and harps. You will hear the sound of music again. You will hear the sound of dancing and the sound of rejoicing. 
All right. Tophet is ordained of old. Yea, for the king is prepared. He hath made it deep and large. The pile thereof is fire and much wood. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, doth kindle it. Again, he has switched into this present time that we're in. Okay? Not the immediate future of, um, of Israel. It's this present time that we are in. And there's a scripture and a, a, it's a screenshot that I have. Please remind me if I forget for you to go and see where Tophet is today and what happened to Tophet last year, just this past 2020. For you to know that the word of God is truth. So as soon as we wrap up our study, I'll put it on our WhatsApp chat group and you can go and see why it says, Tophet is ordained of old, yea, for the king it is prepared. He hath made it deep and large, the power thereof is fire and much wood. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, doth kindle it. All right. Any questions? Any thoughts? Anyone? Pastor Mo, the, the part about waiting on the Lord and strength, you know, like it's um, Isaiah 14, 31, mm -hmm. I think. Those who wait upon the Lord, so it's like, it's not by your doing, it's by waiting. And it kind of also ties with Ephesians 6, where it says, after you've done all you know how to do, stand there for but it's, I, I think a lot of times I'm like Peter that I take my away from Jesus and I look at this but in God's kingdom it's like that waiting is you're where the strength comes from you're breaking up and I, it's hard to hear you no I was saying Sorry, the part about the waiting reminded me of Isaiah 40, 31, where it says, um, those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength and they shall soar on wings like eagles. But in the waiting, you know, sometimes I'm, and then, sorry, then in Ephesians 6, where it says, after you've done all you know how to do, stand there for. But most times for me, I think I'm like Peter, when he was walking upon the water where, mm -hmm. Instead of looking at Jesus, he now turned his face and started looking at the things around. So I guess we have to pray for, can we pray for grace to keep our eyes focused on Jesus? Yes, we can. Okay. Oh. Anybody else? God's own kingdom is different, but it says, wait, and you'll be strong. My one is, okay, wait, I'm not doing anything. <laughs> I know we all go through it, you know, it's like you want to hurry God up or you want to assist him. Uh, sometimes we're looking at our biological age and it's like, Lord, I'm 40. When are you going to do it? Lord, I'm 60. When are you going to do it? Lord, when? Nah. the how and the when is not your concern. Yours is to just be obedient to the, to the revelation he's given you concerning that situation and just stay in that place of revelation. If he needs to move you forward, he will. Praise God. Anybody else? And then today you also proved that, theory that a lot of us don't read our Bible because I used to struggle. My, my father-in-law is a deacon or was a deacon in Anglican church. And I followed him to church one day and finally I was pregnant with Kachi and I now said, I'm not standing again. I'm not standing, I'm, not, I'm just going to. And then the music was, Pastor Moe, if, if everybody remembers when we did the book of Psalm, sing to him when I lay. Sing to him on a harp. Make a joyful noise to him. How mm. is an organ a joyful noise? Please pray to tell. Well, if you have an appreciation for the instrument, it is joyful. Pastor Mo, organs are like dirge. <laughs> no, they're not. Ah, Pastor Mo. Okay, maybe the people that have listened to they don't know how to play it. The thing is just very gloomy and miserable, please. <laughs> no, it's not. You need to listen. <laughs> Some organ recitals. Organ by itself. If they were adding trumpet and drum, a hair, maybe perchance. But organ on its own. 
Pastor Mo, please know. You cannot so, convince the, the, the organ, like like the four manual, five manual organs, and we're talking about the relevances now, but they, they do have all of those instruments. They have the trumpet, they have the flute, they have the harp. It takes a person who understands the instrument to play it and to and to do all of the things that it can do. My my elder brother, he has like no less than 15, 20 letters after his name. And the organ is his instrument. You need to hear him. Asmo, please send me a clip privately and I will send you a clip of the ones I used to listen to so that you can see. <laughs> so, yeah, so funny. <laughs> right. let's, let's pray some more, you pray for us. Let's pray. <laughs> thank you, Lord. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are worthy of praise, that you are worthy of trust, um, that your ways are higher than our ways, that your thoughts are so much higher than our thoughts. Thank you for the honor and the privilege that we have, Lord, to come before your throne of grace. Thank you that you are a relational God and that you made a way through your son to have a relationship with us, that you paid such a great price for us. Father, we are eternally grateful. Thank you, Lord, that there is nothing in all of creation, in heaven, on earth, on, underneath the earth that can ever separate us from your love. Thank you that you have made us all differently, Father, Lord, and you have made us to complement one another. Father, you are good. Jesus, you are awesome. Yes, Thank Lord. You. you are just majestic. You are radiant. You are light. Thank you that the entrance of your word brings light. Thank you, Father, Lord, that your work, word works together until you bring everything to completion in your name. Thank you that you have called us a chosen generation, that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that you brought us out of darkness into your marvelous light to show forth your praises. Father, help us, give us the grace to remember that it's all about you. It's all about the glory and the praise of your name. I commit everybody into your hands today, Father Lord. Thank you that you're the one who blesses their going out and coming in. And as we have read today, that as we walk alongside in you, we will hear a voice behind us saying, this is the way, walk in it. Father, thank you, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 All right, folks, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> and so well. I'll send you the organ recital my brother did. I'm going to send, I'm going to search YouTube now and find one old organ recital that you, you agree with me that uh, not everybody is meant to